Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea, because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea, and which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help. Because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being, it, you know, it's, it's, you have to take it into account fundamentally and work with it and so and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny and you can assume that you're going to do it badly and that's really useful because you don't have to beat yourself up it's pretty easy to do it badly but the thing is it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all and that's the continual message that echoes through these historical stories in Genesis it's like these are flawed people they, they should have got the hell out of their house way before they did. Um, and they go out and they stumble around in tyranny and famine and self-betrayal and, and violence. And, but it's a hell of a lot better than just rotting away at home. And that's, the, that's great. So that's good. And so why is that? Well, okay, so you, you start your path and you think that you're heading, you know, towards your star. And so you go in that direction. And then, because you're here, the world looks a particular way, but then when you move here, the world looks different, and you're different as a consequence of having made that voyage. And so what that means is that now that thing that glimmers in front of you is going to have shifted its location. Because you weren't very good at specifying it to begin with, and now that you're a little sharper and more focused than you were, it's, it's going to reveal itself with more accuracy to you. And so then you have to take a you know, it's almost like a 180 degree reversal. But it isn't because, you know, you've... I mean, you've gone this far and that's a long ways to get that far. But that's a lot farther than you would be if you just stayed where you were waiting. And so it doesn't matter that you overshoot continually. Because as you overshoot, even if you don't learn what you should have done, you're going to continually learn what you shouldn't keep doing. And if you learn enough about what you shouldn't keep doing, then that's tantamount at some point to learning at the same time what you should be doing. So it's okay. So it's like this. Now what's cool about it though, I think, is that as you progress, the degree of overshooting starts to decline, right? And that we know that. There's nothing hypothetical about that. As you learn a new skill, like even to play, play a song on the piano, for example, you overshoot madly. You're making all sorts of mistakes to begin with, and then the mistakes, they, they disappear. This guy came up to me last night. He was a kind of a pierced guy, rough looking guy. And uh, about, he's probably in his late 20s, maybe early 30s. He said, uh, I've, I've been smoking drug-free for nine months. And I said, hey, good work, man, because he looked pretty pleased about that. I said, well, you know, hopefully that's a lot better. And he said, it's a lot better. And I said, well, good for you for sticking it out, and I hope you can continue it. And I meant that because I did mean good for you, and I hope you can stick it out. And he knew I meant that because he wouldn't have bloody well told me that to begin with if he didn't think that that was going to be the response. And then he said, I got nine of my mates to do the same thing. Yeah, I thought, right on, man, that's great. And then, you know, this, I was in Birmingham two nights ago and I walked out of the hotel and this kid, working class kid, came up to me, you know, just out of the blue and he said, thank you very much for elevating my vision. 
I thought, hey, look, it's really a good thing to be able to go around the world and to have people stop you on the street and say things like that to you. It's like that's as good as it gets, you know. And people are telling me stories like that all the time. They come up and they say, well, you've watched this. It happens all the time. People come up and they tell me some way that their house was out of order, you know, they're hopeless and, and nihilistic and, and drinking too much and watching too much pornography and procrastinating too much and being not serious with their relationship and not getting along with their parents and, you know, not formulating a vision and not growing up and, well, you know, there's just endless ways that you can descend into a kind of, what would you call it, a kind of grungy, filthy carpet infested hell and and so and then they say look I've been watching your lectures and I I developed a plan for my life and I've been trying to be more responsible and I've been really trying to tell the truth and I mended my relationship with my father and I got married to my girlfriend and now I have a flat and I quit doing drugs and I've just tripled my salary in the last year and um and I didn't commit suicide like I was going to six months ago. I think I have, I don't know, out of the 150 people that I talk to each night, I would say probably over the course of the lecture series, there's probably 10 people like that a night who tell me that. And so, see, and because I believe what I said tonight, I believe that the individual is sovereign and that individual sovereignty is the cornerstone of reality itself and it's the cornerstone of the state and it's the cornerstone of reality itself. I truly believe that to be the case. That every time I hear someone say, look, I've got my act together, I think that's one more weight on, you know, if the scales are always tilting towards good or towards evil, then every time someone decides to straighten themselves up, they, put a ma they take a major weight off the evil side and they put it on the good side and it's not trivial. And I believe that that's what the redemption of the world depends on. It's not political. It happens at the level of the individual. Just like the descent into totalitarian catastrophe occurs when people abandon their sovereign responsibility, which I think is the most accurate way of diagnosing what happened in the 20th century. So whenever someone comes up to me and says, I was not doing so well and here's, you know, three ways where I've really put my life together, we have a little 15 second party and we both know why. And so that's, that's as good as it gets. And so that's happening constantly. And I feel, generally speaking, that these events are like they're celebrations of that. And so interesting to watch the media miss this completely. It's like they don't have the conceptual, what would you say? They don't have the conceptual tools to understand that something might be happening that's worthy of note outside the purely conventional confines of, of you know, the, the stultifying and dull political discourse. I'm a psychologist. I, th I decided a long time ago that the individual was the right level of analysis and so it's an absolute, it's, it's not a pleasure, it's not the right way of thinking about it. What's rule seven? Do what is meaningful, not what is expedient.